Last Friday for Friday Minis, we took a look at the Little Man computer, which is, well, an interesting representation of basically any CPU connected to memory. Now, I actually took some time to do some programming on the Little Man computer, and in fact, I tried to implement Bubble Sort. You saw this at the end of the Friday Minis episode, even though I didn't say that was Bubble Sort, I told you to guess. Well, that was Bubble Sort. And in fact, during the process of actually implementing that, I realized that there were some restrictions in the Little Man computer that made it somewhat harder to do. So I thought, you know, after actually figuring it all out, let's actually come up with a tutorial. Let's actually sort of walk you through the process. And that's what today's video is going to be. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to, well, implement Bubble Sort on the Little Man computer and I'm going to walk you through the entire thought process. But we're not going to be talking a lot about Bubble Sort itself. As you know, this channel has had its beginnings in sorting algorithms. We've done videos on that before. So if you want to check it out, I have a link on screen as well as in the video description, which will go to that old video. Instead, today we're going to confine our attention to the Little Man computer itself. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a chunk of bubble sort code in C and part our way across. This is going to be a fun and rewarding experience, at least it was for me. So without any further ado, let us jump right into analyzing the C code for bubble sort. So let us begin by actually first understanding what bubble sort in C would be like. And then, well, we can port the idea over to the little man computer. So first of all, well, this is what the code looks like. And we can break it down into several subroutines. First and foremost, of course, we would want to define the data itself. Then we'll want to actually create loop variables. And these will serve as counters for us to know how many iterations we've actually gone through in a loop itself. Speaking of the loop itself, we'll also want to actually define the loop boundaries. So at this point, we need to know how much to increment it by per iteration, as well as when to actually finish looping. Then for every iteration in the loop, we'll want to check to see if the two items are actually out of order. In this particular case, we want to actually have our items sorted in ascending order. So if a pair of items are actually descending pairwise, well, we'll want to actually swap them. And this is your standard run-of-the-mill code for performing swapping. You will want to just, you know, create a temp variable, read the data from one slot, then overwrite it. And then for the other slot, we'll take the value back from the temp variable. So essentially, these are the big parts in bubble sort. We actually have some printing code at the bottom of our C code, which we can ignore. So yeah, this essentially forms the main set of tasks we have to do in the Little Man computer implementation. In fact, here's a little sneak peek. As you can see, we do have more or less a good mapping from one to the other, even though there is a lot of code here that could be quite messy. But no matter, we'll actually figure it out in detail as we move along. So now that we've actually taken, you know, the entire bubble sort logic and broken it down into, you know, more or less five distinct subroutines, Let's actually begin implementing those in a Little Man computer. So this is our homemade Little Man computer interface. Basically, well, with this, we can actually start to implement some of the most basic operations within our bubble sort. Let's start by putting in our data, and we're going to actually stick this in mailboxes 90 through to 99. So yeah, these boxes are reserved for our data, and they are what? is going to get sorted at the end of the day. Next, well, what we're going to do is we're going to have to reserve some spaces for the variables we use as well. And I've chosen to actually reserve these two spaces for our loop variables. Now, unlike the spaces here, we're not going to put anything in here. That's fine because our program will populate these boxes and increment them as we go along. Of course, I say our program is going to do it, but what it really means is, well, we're going to have to write code to do it. So the question is, how? How do we do that? 
we want to set them both to zero to start off with. But, well, no instruction here says set a mailbox to zero. In fact, we cannot set any mailbox to any value we like by just using an instruction. Instead, what we're going to have to do is to actually reserve a mailbox just to hold zero. Instead of saying set these to zero, we're going to have to say copy the value of this mailbox over to these slots. And that's how we're going to initialize our loop variables. And in fact, we're going to do that right now. We're going to start by reading off the value of mailbox 79, which of course is this right here. And we're going to read it to the accumulator. Then we're going to store it to these two slots. What that means is by the time we've executed these three instructions in this order, we're going to get zero and zero in these two mailboxes. And that is basically initializing our loop variables. All right, now to do the fun stuff, it is time to actually perform the comparisons and the swapping. Now, here's the deal. As you know, with bubble sort, you actually have to compare each pair, move on to the next pair and compare those and so on and so forth. We're not going to worry about those subsequent steps. We're going to start off by just building a base by just, you know, doing the computation on the first pair of items. We'll worry about the whole moving forward thing later on. The first thing we need to do is to check to see if the two items are in the wrong order in the first place. As mentioned, we're going to pretend we're not looking at item I, we're just going to look at the first pair of items. All we have to do is to load the first item to the accumulator and then perform a subtraction with the item in the next accumulator. Now, why? Why do we do subtraction? See, if we actually have two variables x and y, and if x is less than or equals to y, doing a subtraction will give us a value that is less than or equals to zero. Conversely, if x is greater than y, the result of the subtraction will be positive. Now, it happens that we want to sort things in ascending order. So this is good, this is bad. It also happens that in the instruction set, we actually have a branch instruction that jumps if the accumulator is positive. Now, thanks to the way we've actually set up the subtraction, what this means is we can actually abuse the fact that if this is positive, we need to do something differently than if it actually isn't. So yeah, this is the kind of thought process you'll need to use when you're actually programming at something this low level. Anyway, back to the code itself. Essentially, if the accumulator is positive, we're going to actually jump to mailbox 80. So what this means is if the first pair of items are out of order, well, we'll actually jump to here and our swapping subroutine will start from this box and move forward. Of course, if they're not out of order, the execution will continue down this path. But let's do the swapping first. Basically, what we want to do is we want to actually read the information from the first mailbox and write it to a temp variable. In this case, I've actually set aside mailbox number 89, which is right here, for our temporary variable. So we're going to read the first item and write it to that slot. Then we're going to actually read the value of the second item and just overwrite the first item. Finally, we're going to actually take the value within the temp variable and overwrite mailbox 91. So essentially what we've done is, well, the swap function using a temporary variable. And as you can see, it takes six instructions just to do that. All that's left to do at this point is to make sure that our program jumps from point to point correctly. Of course, if you can recall, this part is actually just initializing our loop variables. Once that's done, we can actually jump to 70 where we are performing our first comparison. Of course, when both these operations are done, we want to actually go back and sort of prepare for the next iteration. And the way I've set it up is that the code that helps you prepare for the next iteration starts right here at box five. So if the items are not out of order, we will pass right through this branch statement and go all the way back. If they are out of order, we will swap them and then go back to the same place. So yeah, hopefully this is still very clear to you. Of course, what we're going to do when we're done with one iteration is to actually increment the loop variable. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually reading off mailbox number 88, which is right here. And that's what we are using for a loop variable. Then we want to increment it by one. Once again, we don't know what one is. 
So we actually have to reserve a mailbox to say that this is what. Therefore, all I'm doing is I'm simply adding 1 to the value that we've read so far. Finally, I'm going to actually write it back to slot number 88. So yeah, incrementing a variable actually takes 3 instructions, plus 1 constant in memory. Next, we want to check to see if we're actually at the end of the array. To do that, we actually perform a subtraction against 9. So this is your subtraction operation, and this is 9 as a constant. Now obviously some branching needs to happen here, and we need to do some work. But before we can talk about that, we need to understand what the whole issue is, the big problem with the little man computer setup that makes moving forward within the list so difficult. Let's begin by taking a look at a statement that is, you know, pretty standard from our C code. While this statement looks very normal to you, it is actually something that little man computer cannot directly do. What this is saying is we want to read from a memory location but where exactly we read from depends on the value of a variable. There is no such thing within the little man computer instruction set that actually allows you to do something like that. What we're going to actually have to do is to make use of a meta programming approach. Because every instruction is just a number, every instruction is just a piece of data, what we can do is we can increment our instruction to make it point to the next item in the list. This may sound a bit complex, it may sound a little bit inelegant, but luckily for us, it is relatively simple to implement. So let's take a look at how this will work. These are the important routines we have at the bottom of our program. If you can recall, essentially this checks the two items to see if they're out of order. If they are, jump to this, which will actually perform the swap. Of course, what we've done is we've actually hard-coded all these values to point to the first pair, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to increment these values so that they end up looking at the second pair. In fact, these are not the only values. There are six values we need to change. So let's take a look at how we're actually going to do that. Remember that what we've done so far at this point is to check and see if the inner loop variable has actually exceeded 9. So what this means, of course, is that if it hasn't, we're going to actually continue to this next chunk, which well, I have allotted two rows for. Essentially, we'll have code to either increment to move on to the next pair of items, or if we've hit the end, in other words, if this actually holds true, we'll actually jump to this part, which will reset all these values to point to the start of the array again. Don't worry if it's not too clear right now. What we're going to do is we're just going to look at the simple one first, well, the relatively simpler one, and then we can talk about the resetting later on. So here's the deal, as mentioned, there are 6 values we need to change, and essentially, all we have to do is to just increment them. As mentioned earlier, incrementation is reading, adding 1 to it, and then writing it back. So this first statement targets mailbox 70, and yeah, essentially you do the same thing 6 times over, and each one of these triplets of statements will increment each one of these values. Of course, when the incrementation is actually done, we'll want to jump all the way back and perform our next iteration of the comparison. So hopefully that wasn't too bad. When I explain this way, hopefully it makes a lot more sense than having to actually stare at a bunch of numbers. But yeah, what we can now do is we can move on to the resetting part. Essentially what we want to do is to reset our comparison set to the first pair. The easiest way to do it is to simply, well, just set all the values that we have been incrementing back to their original values. So what I've done is I've actually hard-coded the original values here. These will never be run as code. These are just variables holding the original values. Of course, bearing in mind that these values will get obliterated later on. So yeah, all that remains for us to do is to copy these values back to their original positions. Once again, when pictured like this, hopefully it isn't too bad. Well, all we have to do is to write code to do this. What does this say? Very simply, read from 60 and write the value to 70 and 80. Read from 61, which is this value, and write it to 71. So essentially, it is exactly what you see in this slide here. We're just copying and pasting. Now, there is actually one more thing we want to do at this point. If you cast your mind back to the C code, 
essentially what we are doing here is when the inner loop has actually finished doing its 9 iterations and it's looped all the way back to the outer loop. So in addition to resetting all the variables, which is the equivalent of doing this, what we'll also want to do is to check to see if the outer loop can actually terminate. Of course, because we're working at a very low level, we have to think about this in several low level steps. We need to increment the counter of the outer loop and check it against this condition to see if we have to loop again. Of course, if we do, we do have to reset the inner loop counter value as well. So back in our code, essentially we have to add a few more statements to do that. First, we actually read from 79, which is zero, and we overwrite 88, which of course is our inner loop counter. Then this is your incrementation operation. Hopefully this starts to look familiar to you. We are actually incrementing our outer loop counter. Finally, we subtract nine from it, and then we perform a comparison to see if the result of this computation is zero. If it is, then we're done. And essentially this tells you to jump to position 50, which just contains the halt statement. Of course, if it isn't done, then we'll simply jump back to 70, which is where we actually start to perform our comparisons. And in fact, what we've just done is bubble sort. This is sufficient for us to perform bubble sorting on the data that we've actually included here. And now with everything in place, we can actually take a look at our program in action. Now, while we are enjoying the run of our completed program, there are a few things I'd like you to pay attention to. First, of course, observe that the list at the bottom is actually getting sorted. Swaps are made when pairs are out of order. Then, observe the mailboxes that are first being modified, you know, when a blue highlight actually appears. And then later on, they're actually executed. And that's what happens when a red box runs through it. This is meta programming in action. We're changing up an instruction and then executing it. You probably want to keep an eye on the loop variables as well. They are changing in the way that we expect. Of course, these actually determine which subroutines are being visited. And as a result, you can actually see some patterns. For example, like the reset subroutine is actually visited far less often than the increment subroutine. And there you have it. What we've just implemented is the simplest variant of bubble sort. Normally, bubble sort comes with several optimizations, none of which we have actually done here. First, what bubble sort does is it actually creates a sorted sublist on the right side of the list. And what that means is technically when we're doing our sorting pass, we don't have to go all the way to the end. For every iteration as we're moving forward, we can stop when we hit the start of the sorted sublist. So every iteration, we actually save on having to process those items. Another optimization is in the fact that you can stop if you've actually you know, gone one pass and haven't swapped anything within that pass. What that means is everything is already sorted and we can stop you know, no matter how early it is. Both of these things aren't too hard to implement. I think the biggest headache here would be you know, the fact that we don't have a lot of space left within our grid. I guess we could make some modifications to make the grid larger or we can clean up the existing code to make a bit more space. I'm sure there are places in which we can perform some amount of optimization. So yeah, there you have it. That's implementing bubble sort on the little man computer using some sort of a meta programming technique. It's definitely much easier to express ourselves in a higher level language like C. And when we actually think about what that translates to at a low level, well, things get a lot more complex. So yeah, I guess the takeaway from this is we should be happy with our high level languages. That's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. 
And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support. 